Okay, greetings, greetings, and welcome to the Real English Tuesday Afternoon Book Club. We are the Real English Party Online, and I am your Real English Party host, and in this case, book club model reader, Justin. And I'm here to read now chapter 15 of Stephen King's novel, Fairy Tale. Of course, if you want to know more about previous readings of this book, you need only check out our previous events. You can go to realenglishpartyonline.com if that's not how you're viewing this, and you will just go to our previous events calendar, check out any previous Tuesday afternoon book, book club, and you will be able to view the live stream preceding this one if I've done things correctly. Of course, I don't always do things correctly. I did notice that this event on my calendar appears to be scheduled from 3 o'clock until 4.30. And uh, in actuality, we are not doing that. This was originally supposed to be scheduled as a one-hour event. And the way I have it now is that we're going to, we're going to continue to read this event until we reach the end of the chapter or until we reach the one hour mark just about or wh whichever comes first uh, because this is my event and there's no one else in attendance in this event i can pretty much make up the rules i can start when i want i can finish what i want but just bear in mind if at any time you would like to start your own real english party online book club or in-person book club of course we will begin on time and we will finish on time based on the time constraints that you have I guess the price model on this was you would pay 2,200 yen for one hour at this book club online, which is really intended to be 1,100 yen because we hope that you'll become a Real English Party online member. And if you do that, of course, it's 50% off of these kind of online events. So we hope that you will do that. And at any time you can join or you can request your own book club, based on whatever book it is that you would like to read, that is up to you. This I have done just as a promotional for this site and for this type of event. So I chose my book, uh, a book I've been wanting to read and at a level I'm comfortable reading at so that you could see at least, even if at a higher or lower level than your own, how a book club would go, right? We're basically just reading the story if there's a group here to read with, then we're going to stop after every page or every part, depending on the level of the group. And we'll discuss the, some new vocabularies or phrases, try to discuss what happens in the story. Because my idea is that the only way to get new vocabulary is to obviously learn new words, but not only learn those new words, but learn them in the context that they are used. For example, in a story like this, and then to use them in similar contexts, which you would do if you learned them reading a book and then use them to discuss what you've read in the book. So that's the whole idea for the Real English Party is that we read a few verses, we discuss what we've read, we explore what the new vocabulary might be, and we have a good time doing it. Of course, we're starting at three o'clock it looks like we're going to finish about 4 o'clock. I think sunset is just about at 4.30, so it might start to get dark by the end of this. So, Google, please. I'm sorry. I should say, hello, Google. That's right. You. Hey, Google. <laughs> please turn on the living room light. With that on, that means as it starts to get darker, we won't be in the dark. You won't be looking at a shadow. That should be good. Okay, so now, we could review uh, what's what's happened in this story. But like I said, I don't want to waste time doing that because we are at the top of this chapter, chapter 15. Of And to be honest, if you haven't taken the time to, to view what has gone on or to listen to what has gone in the previous chapters, maybe it's just not that important to you. Suffice it to say that Charlie is about to begin his adventure that he has already begun. He is in his fantasy world or this fairy tale world that his uh, 
dead older friend has introduced him to. He's brought his dog there because he wants to save his dog. He's met a friend there named Dora. He's staying at her house. She repairs shoes. He ha she has a, a, a brother who sells the new shoes that she has repaired. And now he wants to go into this fairy tale city that apparently where everyone seems to be cursed and he wants to find a sundial where he will be able to heal his dog radar who is getting old and is just basically dying of old age he wants to renew the dog's life and he also wants to save a princess's life right a princess who is also cursed but unlike everyone else who seems to be cursed with a deformed face and gray skin uh, this Beauty princess is still beautiful, but she seems to be cursed with uh, a, a mouth that has her skin grown over it. Basically, she has no mouth, and so she has to pierce that skin and stick a straw in the hole while it before it heals in order to drink her food. So that's quite a curse, and he wants to be able to help her, which is a main theme in the last chapter. So that leaves us with chapter 15. Like I said, we're not doing a full review, but Chapter 15 is called Leaving Dora, Refugees, Peterkin, Woody. Right? So it looks like we're going to get some new characters in this chapter. So we're going to jump right in. Like I said, if you're listening to the recording or if you're watching live, at any time, you can leave a comment. I probably won't be able to respond to comments while I'm reading. I don't have the I have the technology, but I just don't have uh, the time to really check if and when people are leaving comments. Most times people don't leave comments during the event. So if you do view this and you're viewing it live, do leave a comment. I will see the comment after the event. You can leave a comment either on the YouTube channel where this is being broadcast or a live stream, or you can leave a comment on the Real English Party online event page where this is also being live streamed. And if you leave a comment there, you will need to be a member. So we hope that you'll sign up. The membership is free for now and will continue to be free if you sign up in this time that it is free. But uh, do leave a comment if you have any questions about any words or phrases, or if there's uh, maybe if you say, oh, that was too fast, can you say that again slower or something like that? or any comments about what you wish I would do during these event, this event, which I might not do because it's not your event and you can pay for your own. But certainly I'm happy to get the feedback. And if I can't answer it during the event because I don't have time to check that, certainly I will address your comments after, probably in the next event or the event after that. So you do want to keep tuning in, keep checking this out, even if you can't seem to follow everything that's being said and read here, this might be a good way for you to catch some sleep. You know, it's the middle of the day, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe you want to take a nap and English does it for you. Have a listen, let the words just flow over you. And I think over time, you might even begin to understand them more clearly as I read them. At least that's what my experience has been at other book clubs. And even when people weren't reading along, over time, they became more comfortable with the with the pronunciation that I used to read these words, and even with the pace that I read the words, and they began to invest in the story, assuming that you are an English speaker and an English learner. And by a real English speaker and learner, I mean someone who doesn't just study English as a hobby and just pretends that they want to one day speak English, but someone who actually goes out and makes an effort to expose themselves to other English speakers, joins English speaking events, makes English speaking friends, you know, does things in English so that other English speakers can interact with them while they do it, searches things on the internet in English and not in Japanese if it has something to do with learning English, right? These things that anyone who studies English can do, but only real English speakers and learners actually do, right? People who just want to study English, they'll stay in a, their own little world in their native language, and be it Japanese or Chinese or any other language. They'll just continue to look for things to do in English, but in their own native language, which is kind of silly if you want to be a real English speaker, but 
certainly fine to do, uh, but probably not best to do here. So here we are for people who want to speak, be a real English speaker and a real English learner. And this is how real English speakers and learners do it, right? So we're beginning chapter 15, leaving Dora, refugees, Peterkin, Woody. Number one, let me just take a quick swig of my coffee. Okay. Breakfast was scrambled eggs, goose eggs by their size, and chunks of bread toasted over a new fire. There was no butter. There was wonderful strawberry jam. When the meal was finished, I cinched up my pack and put it on. I clipped Radar's leash to her collar. I didn't want her chasing any giant rabbit into the woods and meeting this world's version of Game of Thrones dire wolf. I'll come back, I told Dora, with more confidence than I felt. I almost added, and Radar will be young again when I do, but thought that might, that might jinx the deal. Also, I still found the idea of magical regeneration easy to hope for, but harder to believe, even in Impus. I think I can stay at Leah's, house, Leah's uncle's house tonight assuming he's not allergic to the dogs or something. But I'd like to be there for before dark, thinking it was hard not to. Wolfies. She nodded, but took my elbow. Oh, sorry, lost the page. But took my elbow and led me out to the back door. The line still crisscrossed the yard, but the shoes, slippers, and boots had been taken in, presumably so they couldn't be dampened by the morning dew which I hoped wasn't radioactive. I went around the side of the cottage and there was the little cart I'd seen before. The sacks with the greenery poking out at the tops had been replaced by a package wrapped in burlap and tied with twine. Dora pointed at it, then at my mouth. She held a hand in front of her, her own mouth and opened and closed her partially melted fingers in a chewing gesture. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that one. Geez, no, I can't take your food. I can't take your cart. Isn't that how you take the shoes you mend to your brother's store? She pointed to Radar and made a number of limping steps, first toward the cart and then back to me. Then she pointed south. If I was right about my direction, that was, and walked her fingers in the air, the first part was easy. She was telling me that the cart was for radar once she started to limp. I thought she was also telling me someone, probably her brother, would come for the shoes. Dora pointed to the cart, then made a little gray fist and hit me slightly on the chest three times. You must! I saw her point. I had an elderly dog to care for and a long way to go. At the same time, I hated to take any more from her than I had than I already had. Are you sure? She nodded. Then she held out her arms for a hug, which I was happy to give. She then dropped to her knees and hugged Radar. When she stood up again, she pointed first to the road, then to the crisscrossing lines, then to herself. Get going. I have work to do. I made my own gesture, two thumbs up, then went to the cart and tossed my knapsack in with the supplies she'd packed, which, based on what I'd eaten in the cottage so far, would probably be far more tasty than Mr. Bowditch's sardines. I picked up the long handles and was delighted to find the cart weighed almost nothing, as if it had been made of the world's version of balsa wood. For all I knew, it was. Also, the wheels were greased and didn't squeak, as the wheels of the young couple's cart had done. I thought pulling it would be hardly more difficult than pulling my little red wagon when I was seven. It turned around, but I turned it around and walked to the road, ducking under more lines as I went. Radar padded along beside me. When I reached what I was then thinking of as the city road, 
there wasn't a yellow brick in sight, so that name was out. I turned back. Dora was standing at the side of her cottage with her hands clasped between her breasts. When she saw me looking, she raised them, them she raised them, what? When she saw me looking, she raised them to her mouth and then opened them toward me. I dropped the handles of the cart long enough to copy her gesture, then set out on my way. Here is something I learned in Impus. Good people shine brighter in dark times. Help her too, I thought. Help Dora too. Okay. All right. Yeah, sometimes I'm reading this story and I feel a wave of emotion come over me and I'm not quite sure why because I don't know what's to come. And it just seems like sometimes things happen in this story that are very meaningful. But what's happened so far? Basically, Charlie's at Dora's house. He spent the night there. He had a great night, wakes up, eats a morning breakfast of goose eggs and toast with strawberry jam, no butter. Apparently, maybe they don't have cows and milk there. We can, we might guess. Um, and then he's getting ready to go on his journey, his journey into the city where he'll find the cure for his dog. But of course, Dora insists that he takes her wagon or her cart with him, a cart, I guess, something big enough to carry many things. In that cart, she also puts her some of her repaired shoes and some food for him to eat. He wants to reject that because he doesn't want to take anything more from her, but she points out to him in her way without speaking because she can't speak well, her face is too deformed, that he'll need this cart for radar because the walk will be easy in the beginning, but it's a long walk and toward the end, radar may not be able to walk easily, radar being the dog. So you'll need to put radar, she'll, he'll need to put radar in the court, in the cart, she insists. Also, he'll need food. And maybe those shoes are so that he can give the repaired shoes to her brother, who usually sells the repaired shoes to other people who need shoes as they travel. That's, if you remember, they have a sort of business where she collects the damaged shoes from travelers, and as they walk barefoot or travel barefoot down the way, they reach her brother's house, where they give her some tokens that she gives them in exchange for the shoes, and that he gives them some newly repaired shoes so that they can have fresh shoes for their travels. So it's not a big profitable business, but it's a way that they can help travelers who are traveling by. And of course, so she, he's going to take this red wagon. He's going to take this so that he can then carry a radar along with it. And um, that's basically what's happening. He's leaving and they're waving goodbye in the end. There are some words and phrases that we could look up, look at that you might not know. I'm not sure we've, if we've ever used this phrase, but just in case, I'd like to point it out. Um, I mean, things like this, Game of Thrones direwolf. Um, obviously, this is a cultural reference. When he says something like, you know, you know, I I didn't want radar chasing any giant rabbits into the woods and meeting this world's version of Game of Thrones direwolf. Obviously, when you see Game of Thrones in capital, in the initial caps, with the italicized letters, what that basically means is that is the name of some kind of work. It could be a work of fiction, a book, a movie. In this case, it's a television drama that was very popular in America. And apparently, there was some some character in that drama named Direwolf. I think I watched that drama. I don't remember Direwolf, but it's a very long drama. I don't remember all the characters, and but perhaps there's some kind of scary creature out there. Some oh yeah, I believe it. The die one family had these pet wolves, and they were huge, and and uh, yeah, I guess they were called dire wolves. And of course, we know there are wolfies out in the woods, so he doesn't want radar to meet. Or he doesn't want to meet this world's version of what he saw in Game of Thrones. Right? So he doesn't want to meet a monster in this world that would be similar to a monster he's seen in a drama on HBO, on TV. And then he also says, you know, after Dora says she has to get going, he says that he will be back, right? Let's see, where, where does he say that? Okay, yeah, oh, maybe that's in the first page where it says, 
yeah, he says, I'll come back, I told Dora, right? And then he says, I almost added, and Radar will be young again when I do. But I almost said it, but I didn't, right? But thought that might jinx the deal, right? Jinx the deal. So now, even though you might be an advanced English speaker, you might not have come across the word jinx. If you have, that's good. If you haven't, then you should guess what that means. In this case, to jinx something as a verb is to curse something. In fact, jinx as a noun literally means the noun curse or to put a bad spell on something, which is to do something that assures that it will have a bad outcome. And a long time ago, even now, people often believe if they say a good thing will happen before it happens, that they will jinx it or they will cur curse it and cause it not to happen. So many people are afraid to say that a good thing will happen until it happens, because if they do, then it doesn't happen. So he didn't want to jinx the deal. In this case, the deal is his being able to find a way to heal or, as he says, regenerate radar, right? So he doesn't want to jinx the deal. In this case, to jinx the deal means to speak about it so confidently that it almost assures that God or the kami or whatever controls our fate makes sure it doesn't happen because he jinxed it, right? So he doesn't want to jinx the deal. That's one word I wanted to teach to. There are other words in this part, but as I said, we want to move through this so that we get through this maybe one chapter per event, if possible, if we can do that in one hour. So we're moving on to part two, right? And so now Charlie is on the road. Let us begin. We walked uphill and down dale, as one of those old stories might say. Crickets churred and birds sang. The poppies on our left occasionally gave way to tilled fields where I saw gray men and women, not a lot, working. They saw me and stopped what they were doing until I went by. I waved, but only one of them, a woman wearing a big straw hat, waved back. There were other fields lying fallow and forgotten. Weeds sprouted among, among the growing vegetables, along with bright scarves of, of poppies, which I thought would eventually take over. On the right, the woods continued. There were a few farmhouses, but most of them were deserted. Twice rabbits as big as small dogs hopped across the path. Radar looked at them with interest, but showed no inclination to chase them. So I unclipped her lead and tossed it in the cart. Don't disappoint me, girl. After an hour or so, I stopped to untie the good-sized bundle of food Dora had packed for me. There were molasses cookies among the other goodies. No chocolate in those, so I gave one to Radar who snarked it up. There were also three long glass jars wrapped in clean rags. Two were filled with water and one contained what looked like tea. I drank some water and gave some to Radar in a pottery cup my friend had also packed. She lapped it up eagerly. As I finished repacking, I saw three people trudging down the road toward me. The two men were just beginning to turn gray, but the woman walking between them was as dark as a summer thundercloud. One of her eyes was pulled up in a slit that stretched all the way to her temple, an awful thing to look at. Except for a single blue gleam of iris like a shard of sapphire, the other was buried in a lump of gray flesh. She was wearing a filthy dress that bulged out in what could only be a late stage pregnancy. She held a bundle wrapped in a filthy blanket. One of the men was wearing a pair of boots with buckles on the sides. They reminded me of the one I'd seen hanging on a line in Dora's backyard when I had made my first visit. The other man wore sandals. The woman's feet were bare. They saw Radar sitting in the road and paused. Don't worry, I called. She won't bite you. 
they came on slowly, then stopped again. It was the holstering gun they were looking at me now, so I raised my hands, palms out. They began walking again, but shying away over the left side of the road, looking at radar, looking at me, then back to radar again. We mean you no harm, I said. The men were skinny and tired looking. The woman looked flat out exhausted. Hold on a minute, I said. In case they didn't understand me, I held up my hand in a policeman stop gesture. Please. They stopped. It was a mighty sad looking trio. Up close, I could see that the men's mouths were beginning to turn up. Soon they would be crescents that hardly moved like Doris. They huddled next to the woman when I reached into my pocket and she pulled and she pulled her bundle to her breasts. I got one of the little leather shoes and held it out to her. Take it, please. She stretched out, she stretched out hesitantly, then snatched it from my hand as if she expected me to grab her. When she did, the blanket fell away from her bundle and I saw her dead baby. Maybe a year or so, maybe a year old. It was as gray as the lid of my mother's coffin. Coffin. Soon this poor woman would have another, re, another to replace it, and probably that one would die too. If the woman didn't die first, that was, or during her labor. Do you understand me? We understand, said the man in the boots. His voice was grating, but otherwise normal enough. What would you have with us, stranger, if not our lives? For we have nothing else. No, of course they didn't. If a person had done this or caused it to be done, the pers that person belonged in hell, the deepest pit of thereof. I can't give you my cart or my food, for I have far to go and my dog is old. But if you walk another three, I tried to say miles, but the word wouldn't come. I started again. If you walk until maybe midday, you'll see the sign of the red shoe. The lady who lives in that place will let you rest and may give you food and drink. That wasn't exactly a promise. My dad was fond of po pointing out that, pointing out what he called weasel words in the TV commercials for wonder drugs. And I knew Dora couldn't feed and water every group of refugees that passed her cottage. But I thought when she was the state of the, of the woman and the horrific bundle she carried, that she would be moved to help these three. Meanwhile, the man in the sandals was examining a little leather shoe. He asked what it was for. Further on, past the woman I told you about is a store where you can give that token for a pair of shoes. Is there burying? This was the man in boots. For my son needs a burying. I don't know. I'm a stranger here. Ask at the sign of the red shoe or at the farm of the goose girl further on. Madam, I'm sorry for your loss. He was a good boy, she said, looking down at her dead child. My Tam was a good boy. He was fine when he was born, rosy as the dawn. But then the grave fell on him. Walk your way, sir, and we'll walk ours. Wait a minute, please. I opened my pack, rummaged and found two cans of King Oscar sardines. I held them out, then shied away from them. No, it's all right. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to read that again. One more time for I held. I held them out. They shied away from them. No, it's all right. It's food. Sardines, little fish. You pull the ring at the top to get them. See, I tapped it. The two women looked at each other, then shook their heads. They wanted nothing to do with pull top cans, it seemed. And the woman seemed to have, and the woman seemed to have disconnected from the conversation entirely. We need to get on, said the one in the sandals. As for you, young man, you're going the wrong way. It's the way I have to go, I said. He looked me straight in the eye and said, that way is death. They went on, trudging up dust from the city road. 
the woman carrying her awful burden. Why did one of the men not take it from her? I was just a kid, but I thought I knew the answer to that. He was hers, her town, and his body was hers to carry for as long as she could carry it. Okay, all right. So this part was a very dark part. Yeah, he's walking along the road. As he's walking along the road, he sees a few people, a few farmers, right? A few farmers, only one of those farmers ever wave at him. They just sort of look at him until he passes by because I guess he's such a, a foreigner. He looks different. He's an outsider, so they're a little, a little uh, concerned about him. Uh, and But most of the farms that he passes seem to be uncared for. He's saying that you know, a lot of the the vegetables were overgrown with weeds and the poppies he, he thought would again take over. Poppies are a kind of wild flower, if you will, if we haven't discovered that yet. One word that he used that I thought was very useful, I learned this today. Of course, I always wondered what sound we use for insects when they make some kind of songy sound. Like for example, when you hear cicada in the summer and they make that or that me, 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 right? That sound that insects make. Or for example, crickets at night, you know, they make these noises. And I never know what to call those noises. I know when we say a bird, we say birds sing, you know, lions roar and cats meow and dogs bark. But here is something that I've learned. You could say that crickets chur, right? He said, the crickets churred and birds sang. So there was a new verb that I have learned. Hopefully I will use that as soon as possible. He could hear the crickets churring. And perhaps that word churring could be used not only for crickets, but maybe also for cicada. Maybe we could say in the summer in Japan, we can hear the cicada churring in the background. That's a very useful word, especially if you live in Japan, right? So that word chur, that's a, that's a useful word. And I think actually the dictionary just says of an insect, what a prolonged, low, thrilling sound. So they make a long, low, thrilling sound that is a churring. It's a long, low, thrilling sound. So I don't know if cicada will work, but I think if I used it, the cicadas were churring in the background. I think that people would understand it and begin to use it as well. So that is a useful word to use, I think, for any insect sounds that we might hear in large and wonderful amounts, like crickets at night or cicada in the daytime in the summer. So I wanted to point that out as a, as a very good word that you can use. Also, another word or phrase that you might not know, but you should be able to guess, it says here that there were other fields lying fallow and forgotten. Right? What does this word fallow mean? To lie fallow. Obviously, to lie fallow is just to be flat and be there laying or lying. Flower, fallow. But fallow, in this case, what does it mean? I guess we have to say, since the word fallow is paired with the adjective forgotten, maybe it, it means what I said earlier, uncared for, right? Fallow means nothing growing on it or nothing bearing no fruit. That's what fallow means. When we say a field that bears no fruit or vegetables, there's no harvest, nothing to be harvested, that field is fallow. And I'm sure you can see lots of fallow fields, perhaps in, a, in the countryside where you live, because these days there are far few farmers than there have been in the past. So many fields are lying fallow, while most industries have taken up the most productive farms and are and are making most of our food these days, right? Not all, but most of them. So what he's basically saying here with the fields lying fallow, I think what he's indicating is that there are not many people left. Perhaps most of the farmers have died from this curse, which they have calling, I think that, that one of the travelers called the gray has fallen, that has fallen upon them. So this curse called the gray that has come upon them has probably killed most of the people in this countryside. And so that's some kind of a, some kind of an indicator of that. 
Another word he used, he used some a lot of good words here that I don't often use, but I may in the future. It says, no chocolate. So I gave one to Radar who snarked it up, snarked it up. Now, I had never used the word snark before, but I think I know what it means because I can envision it. And the, the form of the word kind of gives me a sense of that sound, snark. <laughs> right? <clears throat> That's a snark sound. So to snark something up would be like if you feed something to a dog and a dog quickly eats it, making that sound, <laughs> right? That's to snark something up. I can already tell that what that's what it means. I don't need to look it up in the dictionary. Just from hearing that word, he snarked it up. So to eat something up very quickly, like a dog making a, you know, a uh, a, sna a sound that sounds almost like a growl when you eat it because you're snarking it up so fast, that is to snark something up. Another word he used, which I often do use, is I also, I gave, I guess, what did he say also? I drank some water and gave some to Radar in a pottery cup, and she lapped it up eagerly. So lap, to lap something up, to lap up, that's an, a useful word, particularly when you're talking about animals. You see, when we take in liquid, we drink it. We have it in a cup, we put the cup to our mouth, and we let it slide down our throat. That is to drink. But animals do not have hands that can hold cups and bowls and things like that, so they can't bring the food to their mouth. They must drink the food by dipping their tongue into it and bringing little by little food from the bowl into their mouth using their tongue. And to do that is to lap, to lap something or to lap something up. So he lapped it up, right? Snarked it up and lapped it up, right? These are useful phrases to talk about the ways that animals eat and drink, right? And also bear in mind when we use a verb with up in this case, especially something that has to do with consuming, eat it up, drink it up, snark it up, lap it up. It means basically to do something completely, right? So to snark it up is to eat it completely. To lap it up is to drink it completely, right? So those are useful words and phrases that if you did not know them until now, they should be useful to you in the future if you're ever talking about what animals do when they're consuming their food and drink. There are some other words here that could be useful to you, but to know more about those, you'd really have to join in, right? We're only up to part three of this chapter, and so we'd better get moving if we want to finish this chapter by the end of the hour. Something tells me that we will not be able to finish this chapter by the end of the hour, and we'll have to perhaps finish the chapter next time, which would be perfectly fine. We're in no rush. So let us now begin part three. I felt stupid about offering them the rest of the cookies and selfish about keeping the cart, but Radar fell behind, that was. I was too deep in my own thoughts to notice when that happened. And you may be surprised or not to learn those thoughts had little to do with Sandalman's doomish parting words. The idea that I could get killed going in the direction of the city came as no great surprise to me. Mr. Bowditch, Dora, and Leia had all made that great, that clear in their various ways. But when you're a kid, it's easy to believe that you will be the exception, the one who wins through and gets the laurels. After all, who had scored the winning touchdown in the Turkey Bowl? Who had disarmed Christopher Polly? I was at an age when it's impossible to believe that fast reflexes and reasonable care can surmount most obstacles. I was thinking about the language we were speaking. What I heard wasn't exactly colloquial American English, but it wasn't archaic either. There were no V's and vowels and may's and please, you, please use, nor was it English English of all those IMAX fantasy films where all the hobbits and elves and wizards sound like members of parliament. It was the sort of English you'd expect to read in a slightly modernized fairy tale. 
Then there was me. I had said I couldn't give them my cart, for I had far to go, and my dog was old. If I'd been talking to someone in Century, I would have said, because I have a long way to go. I had spoken of the sign of the red shoe. Instead of saying, it's a little house with a shoe and with a sign with a shoe sign in front. And I hadn't called the pregnant woman ma'am, as I would have in my hometown. I had called her madam. And it had come out of my mouth sounding perfectly okay. I thought again of the funnel filling with stars. I thought I was one of those stars now. I thought I was becoming part of the story. I looked for radar and she wasn't there, which gave me a nasty jolt. I lowered the poles of the wagon to the road and looked behind me. She was 20 yards back, limping along as fast as she could with her tongue lolling from the side of her mouth. Jesus, girl, I'm sorry. I carried her to the cart, making sure to lace my hands under her belly and stay away from those painful back legs. I gave her another drink from her cup, tilting it to so she could get as much as she wanted, then scratched behind her ears. Why didn't you say something? Well, duh, it wasn't that kind of a fairy tale. Right, okay, so this part was a little shorter. We don't have to spend so much time on it. He is thinking now as he's walking on, after he leaves these travelers who were so scared of him, that he, okay, he was embarrassed by, he was too embarrassed to offer them his cookies. They rejected his sardines because they were scared of the can, so he didn't offer his sardines. But he was curious about not only the way that, excuse me, the way that people talk in this fairy tale land, they don't talk, like he said, they don't talk like old English which we would say is like Shakespearean English, we would say, where art thou, Romeo, using things like thee and thou instead of I and you, right? Or they don't say things like, may it please you, or which is, is if when we say things like, would you like, or if you would like, they would say something like, may it please you in old English, if you go back to the 1400s or the, you know, the, the 15th or 16th century. They weren't speaking that kind of old English, and they weren't speaking English English, what he calls English English. Of course, you understand this character in this book and the author is American, so we speak American English. And so when we say English English, what we really mean is British English, all right? And if you watch a lot of the great blockbuster fairy tale movies, in, even in Hollywood, oftentimes the characters have this British accent for no real reason. It's not like they're in England, although we, I guess we have a sense of Europe being the place where these fairy tales take case, take place. So the characters often have a British accent, even though there's no particular English that they should be speaking. It's usually British English that comes out, not only in our old fairy tales, but in our newer, more sci-fi based ones like Star Wars. A lot of the time the characters have a British accent. And he was just saying, oh, it doesn't have, they didn't have that English English at all. It was sort of a modern English, but a little bit of old world, right? So they didn't use any kind of modern slang or anything like that. He also noticed that the way he speaks is starting to change, right? He's not, you know, he would say something like, I have a long way to go, right? That's, the, that, that's how he would speak at home. But instead, when he was talking to them, he said, uh, what, what did he say? He said, I had far to go. I had far to go. So we would say in regular American English, I have a long way to go. But he said, I have far to go, which sounds a little bit closer to more like British English, maybe, or a little bit more formal than we would speak in modern American English. So he's speaking a little bit more formally. Instead of referring to you know, he, he should have said in his own, his own English, it's a little house with a shoe sign in front. But he said something like someplace with the sign of the red shoe, right? Something like that. This is not natural English where he comes from, but it came out very naturally to him while he's there. So he imagines that 
This is because he is now becoming more a part of this world. And so even his language is changing. And while he's contemplating all of that, he realizes that he's left radar behind because radar is now becoming weak in the journey and cannot walk as fast. And so now he takes, he collects radar, puts radar into the cart, gives radar some more water, and the journey continues. All right. And of course, he asks, why didn't you say something? And he says, well, duh, which is a phrase that we say when we say it should be obvious or that's a stupid question because it wasn't that kind of fairy tale. In other words, in some fairy tales, animals can speak, but this is not that kind of fairy tale. It's kind of a comment, kind of a joke from the author, I think, from Stephen King. But let's continue on, right? Part four. I think this might be the last part unless it's very short. So here we go. We walked on, hill and dale, dale and hill. We saw more refugees. Some shrank away, but two men walking together stopped and stood on their toes to peer on into the cart and see what was there. Radar growled at them, but given her patchy fur and white muzzle, I doubt if she scared them much. The gun on my hip was different. They had shoes, so I didn't give out any in my last token. I don't think I would have suggested they stop at Doris even if either. I wouldn't, hold on one more time. I'm going to say that again. I don't think I would have suggested they stop at Doris even if they'd been barefoot. I didn't, I didn't give them any of my food either. There were fields they could forage in if they were hungry enough. If it's seafront you're looking, you're going for, turn around, boy. The grays come there too. Thanks for the info would have come out. Thanks for telling me. I picked up the cart's poles, but kept an eye on them to make sure they kept going. Around noon, we came to a marshy place that had overspread the road and turned it muddy. I bent my back and pulled the cart faster until we were there, we were through it not wanting to get stuck. The cart wasn't much heavier with radar on board, which told me more than I really wanted to know. Once we were back on dry ground again, I pulled over in the shade of what looked like one of the oaks in Cavanaugh Park. There was fried rabbit meat in one of the little bundles Dora had packed, and I shared it, even Stephen, with radar, or tried to. She ate two chunks, but dropped the third between her front paw and looked at me apologetically. Even in the shade, I could see that her eyes were growing roomy again. It crossed my mind that she had caught whatever was going around, the gray, but I rejected the idea. It was age, pure and simple. It was hard to tell how much time she had left, but I didn't think it was a lot. While we ate, more giant-sized rabbits were lolloping across the road. Then a couple of crickets that were about double the size of the ones I, I was used to, hopping nimbly along on their back legs. I was amazed at how much air they could get between jumps. A hawk, normal sized, swooped down and tried to grab one of them, but the cricket, the cricket took evasive action and was soon out of sight in the grass and weeds that bordered the forest. Radar watched this parade of wildlife with interest, but without getting to her feet, let alone giving chase. I drank some of the tea, which was sugary and delicious. I had to stop myself after a few swallows. God knew when, the might, when there might be more. Come on, girl. Want to get to the uncles? The idea of camping out near those woods doesn't thrill me. I picked her up, then paused. Written on the oak in fading red paint were two letters, A, B. Knowing Mr. Bowditch had been here before me, made me feel better. It was as if he wasn't entirely gone. Okay, so he's traveling along. He sees, the way they see some strangers that aren't so scared, but so they're a little weary of them, but he's got his gun. 
so they're okay. It looks like Radar is getting sick again. His eyes are getting roomy. We discussed in the last time, roomy has to do with rheumatosis. So basically when a liquid grows somewhere, continues. So his eyes are having a, a film of liquid in his eyes, something we often see in old people, people who are near to death perhaps. So he's seeing that his dog is getting older and weaker. He's considering possibly that it's the gray, the disease that's spreading around this area, but doesn't want to think about that. He's just saying it's just age. And so being able to put him on this carousel sundial should be able to solve the problem. That's what he wants to believe. And as he set, settles down, of course, I guess to get some rest uh, before taking, picking up again, he notices that, uh, well, I guess, written on a, an oak. An oak in this case is an oak tree, a big tree, fading red paint. There were two letters, A, B, uh, which is Mr. Mr. Bowditch's initials. So this tells him that Mr. Bowditch was there before him, which makes him feel better, right? And of course, that was a short part. So we're going to move on to part five, which I'll assume will be the last part of this event. And then we'll finish there. Okay, so we begin part five. Mid-afternoon. The day was warm enough for me to have worked up a good sweat. We hadn't seen any refugees for a while, but as we reached the foot of a rise, long, but with a slope two miles to actually be called a hill, I heard scrambling from behind me. Radar had come to the front of the cart. She was sitting with her paws on the front and her ears up. I stopped and heard something ahead that might have been faint, chuffing laughter. I started forward again, but stopped short of the crest, listening. How do you like that, sweetie? Does it tickle? It was a high, fluting voice that cracked on sweetie and tickle. Otherwise, it was weirdly familiar. And after a moment, I realized why. It sounded like Christopher Polly. I knew it couldn't be, but it sure did. I started forward again, stopping as soon as I could see into the dip on the other side of the rise. I had seen some strange things in this world, but nothing so strange as a child sitting in the dust with a hand clasped around the back legs of a cricket. It was the biggest I'd seen so far, and red instead of black. In his other hand, the child held what looked like a dagger with a short blade and a cracked haft held together with strength. He was too absorbed in, absorbed in what he was doing to see us. He stuck the cricket in its belly, producing a tiny spurt of blood. Until then, I didn't know crickets could bleed. There were other droplets in the dirt, which suggested the kid had been at, his, at this nasty business for some time. Like that, honey. Oh, wait, more, one more time. Like that, honey? The cricket lunged, but with its back legs hobbled, the kid pulled it back easily. How about a little in your <clears throat> radar barked? The kid looked around, not losing his held on the big cricket's back legs, and I saw he wasn't a kid, but a dwarf and old. White hair straggled down his cheeks in clumps. His face was lined the ones bracketing his mouth so deep that he looked like the kind of ventriloquist dummy Leia could have used if she wasn't pretending her horse could talk, that was. His face wasn't doing that melting thing, but his skin was the color of clay. And he still reminded me of Polly, partly because he was small, but mostly because of the slyness in his face. Given that sly look added to what he was doing, I could easily imagine him capable of murdering a limping old jeweler. Who are you? No fear, because I was at some distance and silhouetted against the sky. He hadn't seen the gun yet. What are you doing? I caught this fella. It was quick, but old Peterkin was quicker. I'm trying to see if it feels pain. God knows I do. He prinked the, trick, the cricket again this time between two plates of its carapace. The red cricket bled and struggled. I started pulling the cart down the hill. Radar gave another bark, 
she was still standing with her legs braced on the board at its front. Curb your dog, Sonny. I would if I was you. If she comes near me, I'll cut his throat. I set down the poles and drew poles and drew Mr. Bowditch's P45 from the holster from the, for the first time. You won't cut her on me. Stop doing that. Let it go. The dwarf, the dwarf, Peterkin, regarded the gun with puzzlement rather than fright. Now, why would you want me to do that? I'm only having a little fun in a world where there's hardly any left. You're torturing it. Peter looked amazed. Torture, you say? Torture? Oh, you idiot. It's a damn insect. You can't torture an insect. And why would you care? I cared because watching him hold the thing's jumping leg, its only means of escape, while he poked it again and again, was ugly and cruel. I won't tell you twice. He laughed. And he, so he even sounded a little like Polly with his ha-ha interjections. Shoot me over an insect? I don't think so. I aimed high and to the left and pulled the trigger. The report was much louder than I had than it had been from inside. No, I'm sorry, one more time. The report was much louder than had been from inside Mr. Bowditch's shed. Radar bark. The dwarf jerked in surprise and let go of the cricket. It hopped away into the grass, but crookedly. The damn little thing had lamed it. Only an insect. But that didn't make what this what this Peterkin had been doing right. And how many red crickets had I seen? Only this one. They were probably rare as albino deer. The dwarf got up and dusted off the seat of his bright green britches. He swept the ragged clumps of his hair, his white hair back like a concert pianist, getting ready to play his big number. Leaden skin or no leaden skin, he seemed lively enough, lively as a cricket, so to speak. And while he'd never sing on American Idol, he had a lot more voice than most people I'd met in the last 24 hours, and his face was all present and accounted for. Other than being a dwarf, never call them midgets. They hate it, my dad told me once. And having a shitty complexion that could have been used a, a shot of Otesla, <laughs> he seemed pretty much okay. I see that you are an ir irritable boy, he said, looking at me with disgust. And maybe, I hope so, just the trace of fear. So why don't I go my way and you go yours? That sounds good, but I want to ask you something before we part company. How come your face is more or less normal and so many other folks seem to be getting uglier all the time? Not that he was any poster boy himself, and I'm sure he I'm sure the question was one of oh wait, no, one more time. Not that he was a poster boy himself, and I'm sure the question was on the rude side, but if you can't be rude to a guy you, can't, you catch torturing a giant cricket, who can you be rude to? Maybe because the gods, if you believe in them, already played a trick on me. How would a big fellow like you know what it's like to be a little fellow like me? Not even two dozen, not even two dozen hands from ground to crown. A whining note had come into his voice, the tone of someone who had, in AA lingo, a ring around his ass from sitting on the pity pot. I put my thumb and finger together and rubbed. You see this? Oh, see this? It's the world's smallest violin playing my heart pumps purple piss for you. Piss came out perfectly, I noted. He frowned. Eh? Never mind. My little joke trying to trickle trying to tickle you i'll go on now if you don't mind do that but my dog and i would feel better if you put that knife away before you do you think just because you're on the whole you one more time you think just because you're one of the whole ones you're better than me the little man said you'll see what they do to ones like you if they catch you who will the night soldiers who are they, and what do they do to ones like me? He sneered. Never mind. I'll just, I just hope you can battle, but I doubt it. You look strong on the outside, but I think you're soft on the inside. 
That's the way folks are when they don't have to struggle. Haven't missed any meals, have you, young sir? You're still holding the knife, Mr. Peterkin. Put it away, or I might decide to make you throw it away. The, draw, the, the dwarf jammed the knife into his waistband, and I sort of hoped he'd give himself a cut doing it. The nastier, the better, which was a mean thought. Then I had a meaner one. Suppose I reached out and grabbed the hand that had the, held the red cricket's leg together and snapped it, as I had Polly's, a, as sort of an object lesson. This is what it feels like. I could tell you it wasn't a serious thought, but I think it was. It was too easy to see him using a chokehold on Radar like he used his dagger on her. Prink, prink, prink. He never could have done it when she was in her prime, but her prime had been years ago. But I let him pass. He looked back once before he went over the rise. And that look didn't say, well, we'll meet on the city road, young stranger. The look said, don't let me catch you sleeping. No chance of that. He was on his way to wherever the rest of the refugees were going. But it wasn't until after he was gone that it occurred to me that I really should have made him drop the knife and leave it behind. Okay. All right. Okay, so now he has encountered many people in his travels toward the city, or at least toward the uncle's house, but uh, uh, the princess's uncle's house, that is. Um, but in this particular part, uh, a lot has happened. He, he has run into a dwarf. A dwarf means a small person, a person whose growth stops at a certain height. And this dwarf, I don't know if it's like a fairy tale dwarf, we'll guess so, but this dwarf has a high pitched voice and was enjoying torturing a giant cricket, a giant red cricket with his knife. So he forces the dwarf to let go of the, of the cricket uh, because he doesn't like the idea of torturing helpless creatures using his gun, actually shooting a gun, the report. And by the report, that means the sound of the gun being louder even than in Mr. Bowditch's shack. So he's gotten the dwarf to let this cricket go he has a small fight with this dwarf, and he tries to figure out why the dwarf doesn't suffer from the gray. And the dwarf doesn't really answer his question, but the dwarf does seem to share that he's very bitter because he's a dwarf, and normal-sized people are, don't have to deal with the challenges that he has to deal with. So apparently this dwarf has become a bitter, angry, and perhaps even sadistic person because he's so small, and that's just the kind of person he's chosen to be. This dwarf, dwarf's name is Peterkin. So that's the Peterkin that's in the title of this chapter. Peterkin is this dwarf, dwarf's name. Okay, so he's met the refugees. He's met Peterkin. He's met most of what we saw in the title of this chapter. But then there'll be more that he will run into as we read forward. But we are already after the hour. This really isn't supposed to go to 4.30 according to my plan. So. Of, we will be finishing there. There are other, some words that we could have looked at in this little in this little uh, passage because there's some good words to study. But for that, really, you want to be able to pay attention. If I haven't really focused on those words, it could be because I didn't even know the meaning of those words, but was able to move on and still understand what the passage was about without having to look those words up or make a, a big deal out of those words or phrases. We can still understand that basic thing that's happened. That's the important thing to experience out of reading, that sometimes words that you don't understand, you have to just let them pass over you and focus on the words that you can understand. And uh, shortly, I will be doing a real English pro tip that will help you also with that kind of listening comprehension when it comes when it comes to focusing on just what you should be listening for most importantly. That'll be coming up in a future Real English Pro Tip, Real English Party Pro Tip. Uh, but until then, uh, we have, that's the end of this live streaming event. We do, of course, on our Tuesday evenings, we will have our Tuesday evening book club where we'll be reading otherwise known as Sheila. That is getting a little interesting well as well. We're starting a new chapter there. I'll be sending out a promo very shortly for that. 
Tomorrow night at eight o'clock, we will be reading uh, Dr. Doolittle, The Voyages of Dr. Doolittle. That is also becoming very interesting. It's a good time to join. As I have said, these events only cost 2,200 yen per event, unless you want to join the Real English Party Online website, you could become a member there at no cost to yourself. It's 1,100 yen to pay however you would like to pay. We're setting up new payment arrangements so that we can take pay pay and we can take credit cards but for the time being i think we're pretty much doing cash and bank transfers that kind of a thing uh, or you know paypal this kind of arrangement we can we can work with for now uh, we're still building right we're still building this into a business right now it's really more of a project than a business until you join in until you share this with your friends and tell other people see if other people will be interested in joining this book club or starting a book club of their own taking learning english into their own hands until you do that this is really just a hobby this is just a project we can turn this into a business once you decide to get out there into the real English party online or in person, contact us, contact your friends, make it happen. It's up to you. It really is up to you. No one can give you English. No English conversation school, no grammar school, no, no high school, elementary school. It's not the fault of the education system. No, it's up to you. You have to acquire English by doing things in English. This is only one of the things that you can do. This is only one of the things that the Real English Party offers you. You can make yourself available to this or anything that we offer, or you can think of something new that you'd like to do in English. I think next month, it might be next month or perhaps in March, we're going to be taking a trip to Yokohama and do a small mini tour where We'll have some English speakers and some second language English speakers, second second language English speakers who can practice speaking English and talking about the tour of Yokohama. That's something we can do. We've got some real English dinner parties coming up this weekend. We have a real English happy hour that was last weekend. You know, there's always something that you can join. But if you don't do it and your English is not improving, that's the reason why. It's not because English is hard. It's not because English speakers speak too fast. And it's not because of the education system. It's because you don't do it. You just watch and you wait and hope that one day someone will just give English to you. And it never has happened. It never will. You've got to get out there. Join the real English party in this world. And until next time, and until you do, I'm always here for you to just watch from the sidelines and hope that you can see something that will help you. Until you do come and join the party, I'll be here just to encourage you to do what you know you should do. And I'll be here next week to continue this story because it's something I enjoy doing. And I hope to see you soon in real life, as a real person speaking real English. Until then, please do take care, and we will see you next time.